This fly is a stuck shuck midge. It's a fly I developed probably 25 years ago and I love to fish it. I typically fish in smaller sizes and I'm going to show you today. This fly is going to be tied on an 18. It's a little disproportionate that big, but I think you'll be able to see what I'm doing a wee bit better that way. I love to fish in 20s, 22s, 24s, and 26s. The hook we're going to use is a Daiichi 1130. A Daiichi 1140 works well. A Daiichi 1110 for a straight shank works fairly well. If you want it as a stuck shuck with a little trailing shuck down in the, the film, which is what I prefer, then the 1130 or 1140 Daiichi is, is a great hook for that application. We're going to begin our thread near the eye and proceed to wind back. Just maybe a third of the shank, something like that, and slice the thread off. Now comes the trailing shuck. What I'm going to use on this trailing shuck, there's a variety of things. In this case, this is micro Zelon. Uh, another material that I like to use is a pearlescent mylar, opalescent mylars. You can just simply tie this on as a just a straight piece coming out the back as a little bit of a sparkle and if you watch midges as they merge midges tend to come off really I call it mercuric as that pupa is emerging to the top frequently so I like a little bit of flash uh, you can also tie the tip of a grizzly hackle feather there's a lot of different options of things that you can use for that trailing shuck another option that I'll show you very quickly is to take a piece of pearlescent mylar And we're going to grab onto the mylar with a pair of hackle pliers. And either at the tips or the base, either one. Uh, probably easier at the tips just to show you what I'm going to be doing here. Just grab the tips. And you can put it in the vise or whatever. And we're just going to spin it. And spin it until it literally furls onto itself. And what I mean by that is it gets to the point that when I let up tension on it, it's going to pop onto itself. And I can control, I'm going to spin it a little bit more, I'm going to control where that pop as I put it is by taking my scissor tips, putting it like this, and just let it furl onto itself. Then you can tie that in. Another option, this material is kind of interesting, once you spin it, it stays spun. And you can just tie it in that way if you want to. It just has a little bit of extra flash and crinkle and, and color to it. And you can actually take, let me take another piece real quickly and show you what a single strand looks like. If you take a single strand and spin it, it has a really good effect. Just let it get at the point that it almost is ready to furl onto itself, really pretty tight. Stretch it just a little bit. Just simply let it go. And again, it will stay just like that. And then you have a little bit of a handle to tie it on with. So it makes an interesting flashing trailing shuck. Now let's go ahead and put on this micro Zelon for a trailing shuck. I'll do a thread trap, simply bring the material up and under and slide it up into place. We'll wind over it a couple of winds, trim off the waist. We're also going to be using a thread rib on this fly. And now is the time I want to put my thread rib on. I'll just come up and trap that material in place as well. And I'll slide it into place. I'm going to hold the thread rib off away from me and I'm going to hold the uh, trailing shuck material slightly toward me. I'm going to spin the bobbin holder in a counterclockwise direction and what that does is going to flatten the thread because every time I've taken a wind around I put a clockwise twist in the thread looking down on the face of the clock 12 o'clock away from me, 6 o'clock toward me, it's putting a clockwise twist in the thread plus the thread has an inherent twist within it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unwind it so I have a nice smooth flat foundation and hold those materials separate. I want the thread rib away from me for a reason that you'll see in just a few seconds. Wind on down around the shank. Now we'll come on back up, flatten my thread a little bit so I have a smooth foundation. If you look at a midge closely, there's almost no taper to the abdomen and frankly the thorax as well. So I'm not going to put much of any taper. It's just more for coloration than anything else. At this point, you can go ahead and trim off the shuck to the length that you want it to be. Uh, just be careful not to trim the rib material. 
Now what we'll do is we'll take a hack of pliers, grab onto this rib material, and I've got too much, so I'm going to trim off a little base. I'm going to spin it in a clockwise direction so that it proceeds toward the front. Spin it in a clockwise direction. The more you twist, the more it wants to jump to the front. The less you twist, the less it wants to jump. So in other words, if you want real tight ribs, don't spin it quite as much. If you want widely segmented ribs, then twist a bunch. Now, frequently, I won't put any rib on it at all. Look at the midge you're trying to match. The midge may not have any rib. It's easy enough to leave it off. So don't worry about it. Just, just check the critter and tie accordingly. The rib may not be there. There may not be any distinct segmentation, I mean. Tie it off with one wind of thread, let the material go. Now we're going to put on our wing. A little tough to CDC. I'm going to give you some options on this. If you don't like using CDC, and there's advantages and disadvantages to CDC, a disadvantage is that you have to use a desiccant type floatant if you're going to redress the fly. Uh, if you put a paste floatant, it mats the barbules on the barbs down so that you lose the flotation of the feather. But it's a great material to use. It floats well, it fishes well, it's, it's very impressionistic to the fish. I love using it. But I admit, um, in some situations, I may prefer a synthetic or another material that may actually work in the application, the fishing application, better. So I'll suggest to you a couple of different things. This is ice fur, and it has a lot of crinkliness to it, a lot of sparkle to it. That's something you might use. I happen to have some micro zelon that has a lot of kinkiness to it. Uh, that may be a material that you might want to use. Something along that line works quite nicely. But we'll go ahead and use a CDC feather on this particular fly. I'm going to gather up the barbs. Now, there's a concave and convex side. If you want the wing to kick up, you may want to tie it on this way. If you want the wing to lay down, you may want to tie it on this way. This is a fairly large fly, so I'm actually selecting a CDC feather with a, a shaft, a rachis. Um, generally, I tie the fly, as I say, 22s, 24s, 26s, so that I'm tying with a tuft, a CDC tuft, it's called. There is no rachis. But I needed a little bit bigger feather for this fly. I'll grab the barbs, pull them together with flat thread so I can control it, holding the wing slightly toward me. I'm going to roll the barbs over the top of the body and a couple of wraps and seat it. Now I'm going to slide this wing a little bit shorter because obviously you can see if, if you look at the natural insect this wing is much longer than the natural insect. They have a fairly short wing. So I'm going to slide it forward but I'm not going to slide the material straight toward the eye because that's going to slide these threads. It's going to jump and it will loosen this wind of, of ribbing. So I'm going to reach up and hold onto these barbs and simply slide it up so that the barbs slide, but the thread does not. If you slide it too far, no problem. Just unwind it, retie it on. So now we have it, maybe a little bit shorter, now we have it basically to the length that I want it to be. We're going to leave those butts on there. And now we have one wind here, a second wind here. We're slightly in front of the wing. If you want to take one more wind, if it was a 24, I would not. But on 18, I'm going to go one more wind. We're going to next select our hackle. I want to select a hackle that's going to be about a size 18, in this case because it's 18 hook, and uh, select color accordingly. If you want a grizzly, if you want a black, if you want a dark dun, this happens to be a whiting cape that is called a variant. I love these because they've got a lot of speckling and marking and so forth. They have great color, so I'm going to simply wind it around, look and see if it's about the length that I want. It is. This is enough hackle to literally do probably about four or five flies. That's one of the great things about whiting capes is you get a lot for your dollar. Trim off the butts. You can trim these barbs off at the base if you wish. I generally don't. I simply strip them off. I have a thread foundation so that, remember we began our thread right near the eye, so I've got a thread foundation under there that's going to help to lock this material in place. I'm going to lay the hackle shaft, the rachis, right underneath and simply wind on down. Now by controlling my winds and putting pressure here, it keeps this material on top, keeps this material on the side. I'm going to pull right up there so it stays right up on top. I'm going to go ahead now. I've got this material thoroughly locked in place. I've got my wing butts tied down and they're going to be used here a little bit later on for one more step. One more wind to just about the head width that you're going to tie off the fly. Now we'll take some dubbing. I like to use mole. 
and there's a little CDC barb. Let me get rid of that. I like to use mole. I prefer that for this particular fly. Uh, in fact, what I do with it to make it a little more spiculated, shall we say, I like to chop it about in half and then I put my blend together so the fibers tend to stick out a little bit more. The dubbing is actually going to serve a purpose. It's going to build a tiny bit of a ball to shape the position of where the barbs are going to go. I want the barbs to kind of splay back and slightly forward. So by building a little bit of a mound, it's going to allow that hackle to set that way. Take off the amount of dubbing that I need, and this is enough for probably about three flies. Dub it onto flat thread. I don't like that. Let me just slip that off. It wasn't locking the thread properly. You notice how it twisted away from the thread? That's what I didn't like. I want it to lock onto itself, not spiral around the thread. You can always come back and fill little holes if you need to. Never put on too much dubbing because it'll fall off the thread. It'll just, you've, you've all seen that happen to yourselves, I'm sure. Now that I've dubbed it on flat thread, I can take my finger and simply slide it up into place. And remember, we've got two winds between where the hackle is tied in and where the wing is. We're going to take advantage of that in a little bit. Build up just a little bit of a ball and then one wind to space that out. Just a little bit of a ball right there. Now we're going to just drop our thread over the front. Now we're going to go ahead and wind on our hackle. Use hackle pliers or wind it by hand. I think I'll just wind it by hand. It's a long, huge hackle. Wind over the top. And also one more thing I might add. I've, I've tied it in so that the barbs are not immediately tight to the shank of the hook. And the reason I do that is because I've just gotten in a habit of that. Through the years I've found that if I tie the hackle in so that it's tied to the shank of the hook, what will happen is when you begin that first wind, the first few barbs will stick at an angle right back to the back. You've probably seen that before. Well, if you leave just a little piece of bare shank, you can avoid that. It allows the hackle shaft to get in position, that 90 degree bend, and then lay right over the top so the barbs extend straight out over the top. So now we'll go ahead and begin to wind that around. I'm going to come to the back end of that round ball and allow those hackle barbs to now extend back, kind of kicking back to the back. Now we'll just proceed to wind our, our wraps forward. And actually, that's plenty of hackle for the fly. Since it's an 18, I'll get a little bit more rambunctious and put on more, one more wind that's going to kind of drop and fan the legs of this fly, shall we say, to the front. We'll lock the hackle in place with a couple of winds. We can get the bobbin holder out of the way so we don't trim the thread off accidentally, come in with our scissors and snip out the hackle. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and whip finish the fly. I'll spin my bobbin holder in a counterclockwise direction to flatten the thread out a little bit. Form my whip finish. Now with flattened thread, it doesn't furl onto itself, which is a real joy when you're trying to pull up a whip finish. Also, it won't break the thread when you pull it up. If that thread was twisted and it had furled onto itself, as I pull this knot up, a lot of times when you pull it tight, it'll break. Not a good thing. Take my scissors, come in. Now with a scissor point, I can slice right through it. It'll cut the thread because it's under tension, but it won't cut the hackle barbs off. It'll just slice right past them. Now you've got your thread trimmed off. Now, this little tuft out the front is going to form the antennae of the midge. So I'll simply come up, whack it off. Now we've got our little antennae. Now, the way that this fly fishes, if you leave it just like it is now, it'll set down in the water very much like a parachute. It sets very vertical. I don't want that. I want it to set at about a 45 degree cant. So what I've learned is that if I trim the hackle barbs underneath in a bit of a V, then what will happen is it will set down in that film at about a 45. If I'm tying this in a 26, Daiichi doesn't make a, an 1130 or 1140 in that size. And so what I have to do is I go to an 1110. If I'm tying in a 26 or I'm tying an 1110 a Daiichi in the first place, then I'm going to fish it flush in, on the film rather than down in the film. And then I'll trim the hackle straight across so that it does set more flush in the film. What we'll do now is we're going to look down the face of this feather and we're going to see a spiral. And let me show you what I mean by that. Let me select a hackle feather off of this cape. And as I fan these barbs out, let me kick them up for you a little bit. As I fan these barbs out, you'll see that they radiate. They don't come straight off 90 degrees from the shaft. Well, if you look down the face of your fly after you've tied the fly, you'll notice the hackle barbs do the same thing. They radiate. 
they don't come straight off at 90 degrees. So if I go in here with my scissors straight underneath and I, I just whack these guys off straight in like that, I ended up with an L. I don't end up with a V. So what I have to do is I have to take my barbs and trim them off at a candid angle like this so that now I have a V. So I'm going to actually reach underneath and trim them at an odd angle. I'm not going to come in straight. I'm going to come in an odd angle. And when you tie your own fly, you'll see that. I'm going to have to turn the fly toward me, and I apologize, you may not be able to see what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to rotate it around upside down and actually rotate back into my lap. So I can look down, and now I can actually look down and see that spiral. I'm going to reach into my scissor blades, and my spiral is going that direction. In other words, if the fly had been up the way it was originally, it was coming into me. So what I'm going to do is take my scissor blades and actually hold them a little bit back this direction, come in and trim off that little notch. Now I've got, oop, got one more barb. Now I've got just a nice little V underneath there that's going to support the fly in the position that I want it to be. We'll rotate it back around so you can see a little bit better. And this is a finished stuck shuck midge.